Well, hello there. Good afternoon to you. This is New Central. I'm Kemeni Amano. And I am Mawena Egbeta. A look up to the headlines. This afternoon, pro-National Democratic Congress Group Operation Recover All Loot or Pickett are the Finance Ministry to demand the recovery of all looted state assets. Also coming up, we will attempt finding answers to why Ghana has lost the fight against Galamse despite amending the Minerals and Mining Act in 2019. A lot later, over 2,500 delegates of the Convention People's Party go to Congress to select a flag bearer for the party as the clock ticks down to election 2024. your election command center. Now, voting is currently underway in the Ashanti region to elect a flag bearer for the Convention People's Party for the 2024 election. Wayne Evans is connecting with us live uh, from the Nat Hall in Kumasi, where the elections will take place. Now, we also know that uh, the party, as it elects its uh, flag bearer today, we want to tell you the number of people on the ballot so far. We know uh, with this election only four months away, the former chairperson, uh, Nanakosia Ejapoma Kumankuma, is on the bill. We also know that a private legal practitioner uh, from Ponyao Anoche is also on the bill. Uh, Nanakosia Frimpoma Sapon Kumakuma is on the bill, uh, the former, the immediate past chairperson of the CPP. Um, she is hopeful of clinching the flag bearer slot of the party. On his part, lawyer Frimpo Yao Anoche, a flag bearer hopeful, believes that he is the marketable candidate that can win the hearts of Ghanaians to bring the CPP to power despite few months left to the general election. Now, the CPP since December 2023 has been embroiled in political turmoil coupled with a long-standing leadership dispute. Now, this was after key party officials, including the general secretary and the national and youth organizer, tendered their resignations, which led to the formation of an interim national executive council. We're keeping an eye on events at the Nat Hall in Kumasi. William Evans Inkum will join us shortly. But in the studio with me is Secretary to the Congress Committee, Eben Ajomahe Agbenya. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the news. But the event is happening today. Talk to us about the expectations of you organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to your viewers and listeners. Our expectation is that by the time we finish, we should be able to have a successful Congress that will be just and fair to everybody and to elect a flag bearer who will prepare or lead the party's mm -hmm. campaign towards the 2024 general election and to make, not just to participate, but to make impact in the election. That is what we are expecting mm -hmm. today. Indeed. Uh, one of the things that the flag bearer would be expected to do is to present a united front uh, for the CPP, governize all bases and ensure that the CPP is coming into the election uh, united. What measures are in place to ensure that it happens? Great. Uh, so far, we have been able to fix all that we need to do. Three days ago, and as of yesterday, we we're sure that all our electoral materials had reached all the regions. Some were even airlifted. 
So we have done that. Those that have to do with financial services mm -hmm. were able to do those things yesterday. Those that has to do with transportation and so on, we have been able to settle all that in all the 16 regions. I see. We've been able to establish 17 police stations across the country, 16 in each of the regions, and then one at the party headquarters, mainly for our council members, founding fathers, and central committee members. They are all in place. We have also made sure anything we need to do with Ghana Police Service, mm -hmm. we have satisfied the uh, requirement with Ghana Police Service as well as the Electoral Commission. Uh, so, uh, as of 8 o'clock, voting started across the country. Uh, so, so far, it's been peaceful. Mm. Your reporters will even acknowledge Indeed. Tonight. Speaking of reporters, let's hit the ground now and speak to William Evans Inkum. He's joining us from the Nat Hall in Kumasi. As you heard from Eben, the ele elections are going on across all 16 regions of the country. There are set 17 polling stations. Let's find out from Nat Hall what's happening there now. William, what can you report? All right, so over here, we have two polling stations here. and uh, It is taking care of 420 a delegate. In fact, the elected delegates here are 385. We have the Council of Elders and other, I mean, uh, members of the CPP who add up to 420 delegates. You also understand that out of the 420 delegates, about 30% of them are women. So far, uh, more than 100 delegates have gone through the electoral process. That is the voting process. And uh, we are still counting. Um, they come in, they go through the process, the vote, some of them will leave, the others who are still hanging around. But I can tell you that it has been generally peaceful coming mm. in. I see. Uh, what are delegates saying to you? Well, so uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a two-horse race. Uh, we know that uh, me, Professor Anoche and, of course, um, the only woman in this particular contest. Um, so it's a two-horse race. But it does appear that uh, Frimpoma name's name is being mentioned by most of the delegates here. But Kamini, you and I know, I mean, the popular Sir John saying, fear delegates. We have been talking about her, but as to whether it's going to translate into the results, I think it's just a matter of time, few hours to come. Indeed, William, thank you so much for the reporting. We'll touch base with uh, other reporters across the regions, find out how things are uh, panning out as far as the CPP's Congress is concerned. But with me here is Secretary to the Congress Committee, Eben Agbenya. Uh, Eben, so essentially uh, one of the things going into the elections were the difficulties the CPP, you know, experience yeah. uh, as a party. Now, coming out of the election, we expect that the CPP will be united with sure. whoever is in the lead at the, at the end of the day today. And, and again, I come to the question, what measures have been put in place to ensure that the CPP uh, is united and ready for the fight in 2024, <coughs> December? Thank you very much. It is important that any political party, especially in this crucial moment of his life, needs to do anything possible to, uh, to come together as a united front, especially preparing in this moment. The CPP has the same thing. Uh, so far, we have been able to speak with all our aspirants, even those who were unable to file, mm -hmm. that right after today, we all need to come together. And there has been that meeting between us and our founding members that, that we can't do anything without uniting. Each candidate has signed an undertaking that we need to bring our members together right after the election. Mm. So for us, across the region, the rank and file is prepared that, come what may, we need to have a formidable team right after today. Mm -hmm. We will be starting our campaign even right after the candidate is I declared. See. Considering it's only four months away from Yes, the... we have done mm. it before. Mm. The CPP, when it was banned and in 79, when we were unable to fill the candidate, had to change, go through a lot of reforms. We used three months, and Hillary Liman became president of mm. Ghana. We can do it because we have the records of doing that. We have been able to do what people have not been able to do before. I see. And so we are sure we can do it. And you this think the round. CPP has the same strength as the CPP that brought uh, yes. the money our, into, our into gra power? Our grassroots base is still intact. There's no problem there. So we are of the view that this election, it is an election that we will be able to make a very great impact that the Ghanaian people 
are almost ready to work with us and to go with us. Eben, thank you so much for coming. Most Eben Agbanya, a secretary to the Congress committee. Which committee, which Congress are we talking about? We're uh, referring to the CPP's Congress, which is ongoing in all 16 regions across uh, the country. They will be electing their flag bearer today. And as you heard from Eben, uh, as soon as they know who is leading the party as flag bearer, they will, hail, they will, they will hit the campaign trail running. We'll stay with the politics because this afternoon, flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahamadou Baumia, is back in the Greater Accra region to continue his campaign tour. He is escalating the campaign to cover uh, three constituencies in the region where he is currently undertaking a number of activities to court the votes of electorates. Addressing a rally of party supporters at the Kanishi market in the Okaikwe South constituency, Dr. Baumia announced a scrapping of import duties on mobile phones if elected. Let's touch base with my colleague Stanley Niblo, who's following the vice president through uh, his tour of the Greater Accra region. Stanley, uh, we've heard or we, we, we've read about Dr. Baumia promising the scrapping of import duties on phone. What other thing has he been telling the market women in particular, which we've been seeing him go about greeting and saying hello to? Okay, so Mawana, this afternoon, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, who is storing three constituencies, that is the Okanque Central, Okanque North, and Okanque South constituencies in the Greater Accra region. Um, he has been engaging some of the traders, as you mentioned, and for him, um, when he, um, the electorate are able to vote for him actively to win power and then come to government or become the president in next year, he's going to ensure that he establishes a bank that will only cater for women in the country. Um, apart from that, he has also been saying that um, agriculture, which used to be the backbone, the number one um, got, um, domestic earner for the country, which is now um, has um, shifted to number three after industries and then um, services sector. Dr. Baumia is saying that agriculture, when he comes, he's going to ensure that he pumps in a lot of money and then also reform the way agriculture is being done in the country so that a lot more people can go into it. Um, he has been meeting um, uh, uh, electorates in the, in the district and then he has been sharing mm. aspects of his manifesto that he launched a couple of weeks ago with them. And he believes that the people would actually listen to him and then give him the nod. When he, um, he arrived in the Okanque South um, constituency in the morning, he started from Seco, which is a part of um, um, Arewaso, uh, Arewaso Central, and then he then proceeded to um, Aveno and then to um, Kanishi, where he currently is in the Okanque South constituency. Currently, he is engaging some of the constituents in a town hall meeting. Right. Where he listens to them and then he also told them what he will be doing for the country and for the constituency when elected into power 2025. President. 
and a brand new innocent hand, Diana Mupa. Brand new innocent hand, Diana Mupa. Brand new innocent hand, Diana Mupa. The Santo, Mufastiano, and Mami. Mufastiano, and Mami. Mufastiano, and Mami. Who will do money? I want to do money. Nigeria, <laughs> Port Hono, you have a sister import duty regime, no, I will port her. Port Hono, you have been flat tax ever in cities. The container ever, only that cities are only three. I have spare parts, now the container 40 foot ever, only say, Saw India, I have 20,000 cities. As the Vice President and NPP flag bearer at Torren part of Accra, Stanley Niblo has been following him. We'll be getting updates for you as and when here on your election command centre. It does appear when we move from the camp of the governing party, we'll head to that of the opposition this afternoon, Kemeni. Indeed, the flag bearer of the NDC is accusing government of overseeing an unprecedented level of insecurity that cannot be allowed beyond December 2024, citing the increased armed robbery cases in the Bono region and the lack of logistics for the police to fight uh, the increased cases of armed robbery. John Mahama is promising a massive retooling of the police administration and transparent recruitment to restore social and business confidence. Here's a report by Komla Kluche. So after visiting eight sports in three constituencies on day two of his four-day tour of the Bono East region, John Mahama says his energy is reinvigorated after the massive show of love for the NDC. Tampo South, Pru East and West was the main focus. But in the edge of the Pru East constituency, the clamor for change was overwhelming. The NDC reads. Where two day cities was free. The things we are made to buy is unbelievable. If he cancels it, it will be a big disappointment to me. I labor before going to school. I sincerely trust your mama will not cancel fear For John Mahama, the state of insecurity under the current dispensation is legendary. There is so much insecurity in the country. Robbers have gone on the news. Government has lost control of the situation. Well, I'm telling the robbers, the free will you had to operate under the MPP, the NDC will not countenance it. Then a promise he firmed up to the people of an improved livelihood. Everything they have had is gone bad. But I am resolute that we will emerge victorious at the polls. But as he wraps up his campaign in Zamraba of the Pru West constituency at midnight, the NDC flag bearer says he does not take their support for granted. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Zamraba. Still on a lot more politics this afternoon, the flag bearer of the All People's Congress, Dr. Hassan Ayaraga, is set to unveil his running mate for the 2024 presidential and parliamentary elections. The unveiling will help complete the party's ticket 
as they team up to break the duopoly of the NPP and the NDC. Let's go to Frederick Kunzo Tiani uh, on the phone right now for a bit more in relation to this. Frederick, many thanks for joining us. What can you report at this particular point in time? Right, I'm having now, right now, the flag bearer of the All People's Congress is currently giving his keynote address where he has been urging Ghanaians not to sit aloof, but rather rally behind the All People's Congress, that is the APC. He is challenging Ghanaians that failure to change the NPP and NDC will lead to the continuance of corruption and mismanagement of the economy. And he's also urging Ghanaians to make them the third force because he believes. He is the third force to lead Ghana, and he is the hope that Ghanaians need at the moment. Talking about debate, uh, talking about the issue of debate, you know, mm. the country has currently been the issue of um, who is to debate who, right. where the two political parties, the NPP and NDC, has been challenging each other for a debate or a presidential debate. Well, Dr. Hassan Ayala has believed he is ready to debate both the NPP and NDC. He also believes that his running mate, who he will soon adore to the country, is also ever ready to debate um, Dr. Maitri Opoku Prempe and Professor Nana Jane Opoku Prempe. And uh, so right now we are currently at the last hall where the unveiling is yet to begin. But currently he is giving his keynote address, urging Ghanaians to rally behind him as he completes his ticket for the presidential election this year, Marina. Right, Kunzo, just briefly, if there's been a mention from him of a manifesto as well in the lead up to the election, has that come up in his speech as delivered today? Well, so he's saying that very soon the country would, uh, he will outdoor his uh, manifesto to as well. He said uh, he is, for now, he is to outdoor his running mate. Then subsequently, within the week or sub uh, next week, he will come out with his plans for the country going forward, Marina. Right then, Frederick. Many thanks for those details. That's my colleague, Frederick Kunzo Tiani. Bringing an end to uh, this chapter on a new central election command center for you this afternoon. Away from elections this afternoon, questions are being asked over the level of commitment of the two leading political parties in dealing with the menace of illegal mining in their respective manifestos. Galamse has become a household name and is fast threatening the existence of living things in the country with the Ghana Water Company Limited issuing a red alert of a possible importation of water into the country within the next five years. And so, it has come as little surprise, the subject came up in Parliament, prompting debates between legislators and this comparison by Nsawa Madwejri MP and Majority Whip, Frank Anodompre. And so we will take you to Parliament uh, for that brief uh, excerpt of what many have made the argument is a concluding remarks by the majority whip, Frank Anodompre. If we are to look and investigate, you polluted the water more than us. You polluted the water more than us. Well, we won't compare records, but look ahead into the future and the promises by the two leading parties to deal with the menace in their respective manifestos. And it will come up on your screens right now. And we'll start perhaps with the opposition party, um, John Mahama. But what is on your screen right now is the sanctions regime, which has been amended as of 2019, to deal with persons who are caught up by the law having engaged in illegal mining. And so Section 99 of Act 995, which was amended in 2019, prescribes the following punishment. For a Ghanaian engaged in illegal mining, a fine of not less than 
10,000 penalty units, which amounts to 120,000 cities, and not more than 15,000 penalty units, which is around 180,000 Ghana cities, and or imprisonment of not less than 15 years and not more than 25 years. For a foreigner engaged in the activities of illegal mining, a fine of not less than 100,000 penalty units, 1.2 million cities, and not more than 300,000 penalty units, 3.6 million cities and or imprisonment of not less than 20 years and not more than 25 years, or both the fine and the term of imprisonment. Let's get into the conversations in relation to what the manifesto promises have been by the two leading parties in dealing with the illegal mining menace and what has become uh, a real thorny subject. Let's start off with the opposition NDC fairs and their manifesto, amongst many other things, uh, is prescribing the ban of, of all mining activities, whether legal or illegal, in forest reserves or zones, after re-amending LI 2462. And that is the uh, instrument, amongst many other things, which a lot of civil society organizations have been raising concerns over. And then as well, uh, use AI to locate small-scale mining operations, track excavators and geofence concessions. Also, ban new mining activities in forest reserves and amend the mineral and mining law to impose harsh penalties. Well, we've shown you the penalties and it does look like they are stiff. Now, also, the NDC is promising to decentralize regulatory and line tinting processes for artisanal miners and implementing uh, reforestation and water conservation initiatives. Also, they are promising to resource the Geological Survey Department to prioritize geological investigations as part of a strategy to increase Ghana's stake in the extractive industry. That's on the part of the NDC. Let's look at what the current administration uh, and their flag bearer is promising as well to help deal with the challenge of illegal mining. One, they say that they will use proven reserves data from the Geological Survey Authority to reduce trial and error digging, which is the case. The argument being made is that because there is no data on the reserves as to where the golds are, a lot of these small-scale miners are doing trial and error, reason for which we're seeing a lot of dagger pits. So they are going to use that and then simplify small-scale mining line sensing regime, preventing delays that lead up to indiscriminate mining, scale up mercury free gold catcher machine technology to support profitable and sustainable small-scale mining, and then construct settlement dams to ensure the safe storage and treatment of discharged water, and then comprehensive and collaborative approach to enforce strict adherence to mining laws and regulations. Let's get on to Zoom right now. Daryl Bosu is Deputy Director of Arocha, Ghana. They've raised concerns about the devastating impact of illegal mining. It's been a conversation that's been raging on since last week, all throughout the weekend, up until today. Uh, Mr. Bosu, many thanks for speaking to us. There will be some level of tiredness or apathy in having to have a conversation again about the activities of illegal mining. But we've just walked through the political manifestos of the two leading parties. And from the polls, the parties that are likely to win the December general elections, does it inspire or give confidence that the plans as detailed will help end the illegal mining menace? Mr. Bosu, I'm asking if, based on the manifestos that we've seen, you're trusting the two leading political parties to be able to deal with the illegal mining menace. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I can. I can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, it's interesting to read what the political um, parties are saying about how to deal with what I'm saying. And I must say that going through the manifestos, um, there are some positive sides to what um, both have said. But I would, I would say, general comment, that there's more that could have been done. And then as you mentioned, let me speak to a few of the specifics that you mentioned. Mm. I think I agree to a, a large extent that we need to start, first of all, 
by restoring degraded areas and that's the rivers and also the lands. So a program as has been as has been indicated by NDS, NDC to look at restoration um, Ghana initiative to fix the degraded areas is good. But what is important before we get started with that restoration is the need to stop the current impunity, to stop the irresponsible mining that is happening in our rivers and in, in our forest reserves. So the plan to also ban mining and forest reserve for us is also very welcome. Mm. Again, we think that as a step towards eventually repealing LI 2462, which is practically opening up all forest reserves for mining. So that is a very good um, aspect of that manifesto. And then we also want to see, I think there's also the mention of the fact that they want to look at decentralizing the mining licensing regime. I tend to disagree, and we, we, we say this because mining, as we have already been doing, is a very destructive enterprise. And so, and one enterprise that can displace water services, can displace food security, can even have impact on health. So for such an, a, a, an endeavor, we need to seriously regulate it. The way it used to be before we introduced community mining, mm. I think, was a better regime where we had large-scale mining and then small-scale mining. It was perfect as it was. The lapses in that system were the fact that there wasn't sufficient regulatory compliance and enforcement. So going forward, we need to ensure that we really beef up the compliance and enforcement mechanism. What we are doing now is just a play game. We, we are not really serious about it. That compliance and enforcement should be done right from the point of even where the licenses are given to the point where the miners are on the ground digging the pit and how they dispose of and manage waste on their, on their mining areas. So what? until we do that right. and we are very deliberate about the, about the compliance, mm we are not going to be very successful. I have seen the MPP manifesto, which seems to be more pro um, gold and extractive and also accelerated uh, mining in, in its essence. Mm. It is very limited in terms of the social and environmental safeguards in terms of protecting our water bodies. They just make a mention of the fact that they are going to ensure a balanced and sustainable mining so and also to ensure that our water bodies and, and forest reserves are protected. That for me is not sufficient assurance. We are currently living in a regime where our forests, our water bodies are under siege and would have expected some more crisis response to what they have proposed now in the manifesto. This particular MPP manifesto seems to be looking more at the geological studies that is needed. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, both parties have indicated that they want to be doing those studies ahead of time so that we know where to mine. But I think we need to complement that with an integrated land use system where we are really dedicated to implementing that. And since they don't respect Any boundaries, right? So you go to income websites and you see that there are certain concessions that are overlapping with rivers and forest reserves, mm. which should be the ground, and they think that they can do whatever they want. At the, at, the risk, at, the, at the risk of not wanting to put you to decide which of the manifestos you believe will best serve the interests of the country. country, I'll ask a rather different question as to whether or not you trust that the details are spoken in these various documents is enough to stop the hemorrhage, to stop the destruction, as we've been seeing, as we've been talking about. over the course of last week? Well, that is not a very difficult question to answer. Remember? And I need to say, look at the MPP manifesto. They are in power. They are seeing what is happening. They've seen the mess and the menace and the punity that is at play now. We expected a more crisis response to um, the, the mess we are facing now mm. than they did. So to that extent, I think everything that is indicated in the manifesto, I find it to be business as usual. There's nothing really exceptionally standing out to say that these people are ready to deal with the challenges we are faced with now. I don't see that. And then again, when you come to the NDC, like I said, there are a few propositions in there that are good. 
I mean, now it's a matter of whether they are going to commit to it. So the restorative Ghana is good to see the ban on mining and forest reserves, which we want to see translated into a repeal of LI2462, is done. It's, it's, it's also good to see. But everything else in there is also just, I would say, business as usual. I mean, before 2016, there was mining, and we saw how that also, I mean, got out of hand to the point that even when we we're going to the 2016 election, the MPP rode on the back of coming to really solve all those problems. So they have also had a chance to deal with it. The question is, are they going to commit and seriously stick by what they have indicated in the manifesto? They seem to have an upper hand in terms of the more crisis response things they want to do, like banning the mining and forest reserves. And that's why I saw that they also have, have what they call a ruthless, they said they are going to wage a ruthless war. I hope it is not the same as deploying Vanguard and Operation Halt with some of the police and military sometimes engaging in altercations leading to the loss of lives of some of the miners. I think we need a complete overhaul of how we've managed the menace and impunity. But I think so far, it's mm. a lot of sense as usual. We need very strong positions. And we could have started with also making sure that our water bodies are comprehensively protected. Right. It should be no-go areas. This government has said that our forests and water bodies are no-go areas for mining, but we have not seen a comp complementary enforcement right regime then. to support. We want to see that happen right. in the next government, whoever takes office. Mr. Bosu, I appreciate that you could speak to us this afternoon. That's Daryl Bosu, who is a Deputy Director Coordinator at Arocha Ghana. And he's been speaking to the extent of damage. We want to show you something, uh, what a cursory uh, Google map search on your phone will show you. Now, we're going to show you or take you to the screen right now. And you see it on your screen as well. This is Google map. It's a standard uh, tool or application on your phone, which you can use to get access to wherever it is you're going in terms of direction. Now, if you decide to search for River Pra, cash research on your Google map, and decide to toggle the interface and show a satellite imagery, this is what you get to see. This is a free app you can download on wherever Play Store, App Store, whether it's iPhone, it's Android, you name it. You'll find for yourself satellite imagery of what our river bodies are looking like. And this is just River Pra. If we take you to the Ancobra River as well, you see for yourself what it looks like at this particular point in time in terms of satellite imagery, what our river bodies are looking like as a result of the activities of illegal mining. Begs the question, what state security agencies are doing if a normal free application will give you satellite imagery of what our river bodies are looking like. That's what we'll leave you with as we take our very first break here on New Central. We're back with a bit more stories. Please do stay. Welcome back. You're still live here on News Central. This is uh, TV3. So we'll turn attention to some of the stories now. It's day four after fire engulfed some warehouses, shops and apartments at Makola Zongo Lane. Business activities are still close to traders uh, along that area. A situation the traders lament is making life more difficult for them. Joseph Armstrong is at the Makola Zungu Lane area. He joins, excuse me, he joins us with a bit more on this. Uh, Joseph, good afternoon to you. Talk to us about happenings there. I saw earlier that we're still we're still seeing smoke uh, come out of the the building. Yeah, Kevin, exactly. So, so as I speak now, the fire service still have a, a number of fire tenders. Here. I can count about six of the fire tenders still here trying to douse the inferno completely and we are told also because of the electrical appliances within some of the warehouses it's making it very difficult for them to completely douse the fire but for now i spoke with the pr of the uh, fire service earlier alex king nati who told me that now they've been able to contain the situation in the community 
Mm, I see. And now, we also see that traders have been kept away from the place. Uh, but people are in the buildings close by. The place is engulfed by the smoke coming from the building. Talk to us about the situation there, what it feels like. So, Kemeni, currently, trading activities here have been close to the general public and is between the Accra Rollins Park and also that of the Mokola Zongo Lane. Uh, any trading activities here currently is on hold, and over here they sell normally musical instruments and also um, electrical appliances. Many people I spoke to earlier told me they've traveled from far and near to get themselves some goods. Unfortunately, they got in here, and all you could see uh, is barricade uh, set up by the police to prevent all of them from coming. So, can you can see now, right behind me, you can see some of them standing there, still trying to argue with the police officers that they want to go in there to buy, but they were told that this place has been shut down. Uh, to the entire public and i'm gathering that they are only going to open this place after next week somewhere next week monday if they assess the situation and then they are sure that everything is in order because as long as there's still pockets of fire and also smoke mm. moving out from the building they are not going to allow them because there's a fear that the other story building in which the chinese use as their apartments is likely to come down so they will not allow anybody to get close Kemeni. I see. But uh, what could be the cause of this fire that has been burning for four days or, or three days? What are they telling you? Kemeni, for now, they are still doing the assessment. But as it stands right now, uh, from where I stand, I can see a lot of electrical wires, uh, very combustible materials about the electrical wires. And also, we are told brother gowns, uh, brother wears, we have suits, we have uh, a lot of things that is very difficult for the uh, fire officers who actually does the fire completely and it's, it's a warehouse packed with a lot of goods. There's one woman I spoke to earlier who told me she just offloaded her goods over the weekend on Saturday. That is two containers she brought in on Saturday and then on Sunday morning, fire engulfed the place and the place has been completely. There's another issue that uh, the people here are raising. Yesterday, the regional minister was here and he spoke about the fact that government doesn't have the money to compensate anybody here as it stands now and then they've been reacting to it yet for them well they pay taxes and they declare their goods and so much money has gone wasted and if government will not sympathize with them the last thing they want to hear is government saying they don't have money to compensate them and they are not too happy about that comment made by the original minister Kimini. right let's take a listen to uh the people you spoke with they say fire so we run to here. The time we can, through the fire has, has come. Oh, then they open the, the school too. We want to sell. We want to sell. They have to put the uh, building down. If they put the building down, uh, the fire will stop. They don't want to put the building down. We don't know how they do it. Metro China Bulls. No, I see. And Timmy Coffee and Yakuan Kura Babia, ever Faka Swaka Kurami, who Babia may Fako. Minimo, I have to turn him money away. A better to add any ever an assi. Timmy Kayon and I'm Kayon across your mini mammy. I guess I came to shop a couple of stuff, but I realized the shop I was coming to is, is closed down somewhere. Yeah, I was actually sent on an errand right now to turn back because I'm not buying anything. And then transportation. Mm. I see Joseph is pulling down the building on the table for authorities there at the moment. Well, when I understand now, um, we are yet to uh, hear what they have to say about the uh, state of the building he, from the layman's eye of the layman's view you can see the integrity of the building is it, it, it's not assured because you can see cracks from the top down and obviously um maybe going forward they would have to pull it down because the story building next to it already uh, has collapsed by itself and it looks very risky and dangerous so where the smoke is coming from currently is uh, the building that the traders wish they can pull it down so that they can completely douse the fire. But the officers are also saying that they want to examine the situation for a while before they'll be able to tell whether they have to pull down that uh, structure or not. As it stands right now, the Chinese folk, you can see them uh, walking around here and uh, they are really worried. I spoke with a few of them earlier and they, even though they can't speak the English fluently, they, they, they told me that uh, water, 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 if water was in the tenders, uh, the, the fire service would have been able to do 
a better job by water, no water, mm. no water, no water. I see. Things that keep saying, and that's where they actually live, and that's where they work, and it's their warehouse, it's their shop, and it also serves as their apartment. And this is a building that they put up not more than a year ago. Sometimes, some eight months ago, we are told that building was put up, and then the Chinese people have not occupied it, and this unfortunate incident happened to them. I see, but uh, I'm strong. Is it the case that the tenders there do not have water in them? Kameni, this is an issue that comes up every now and then. And uh, right now, you can see, no far from me, the, the TL, we call it the 10 table ladder that the fire personnel uh, said they needed on the one uh, when the fire uh, started. But the 10 table ladder was not here, it was based in Chema. And I think, I, or I found out that it was faulty. As it stands right now, you can see it's still here, uh, and it's still faulty. They brought in some people to work on it, and uh, the truth. It's very hard, but the far, some of the fire personnel speaking to us behind the scene told us that the 10 table ladder, the only one the country has currently, is not in good shape. Even though they've been, they've been able to uh, brought it to sites, none of them wants to climb on top of it because it's faulty and it goes into the sky. And if you are not fortunate mm. and you are up there and breaking, you'll be uh, found wanting. So even though they brought the 10 table ladder as well, it's not really functioning as not even full for them to move the fire tenders in and out to get water from I the see. hydrants. It's a challenge. And these are things that the fire personnel who say behind the scene, but they all fear to be transferred <laughs> to... Uh, Very well. They don't want to go to Kemeni. Indeed. Uh, Joseph Oliver here. Thank you for the reporting. Joseph Armstrong joined us from uh, Makola Zongo Lane Market area. Uh, there'll be more on the story in subsequent broadcasts. We'll turn attention to another very disturbing situation. The Director General and members of the Ghana Education Service have arrived at the home of Edward Bokete Saki, a an 18-year-old final year student in the General Arts Department of O'Reilly Senior High School who was stabbed to death uh, to express their condolences and support uh, the grieving family. The victim, a General Arts student, was repeat, reportedly engaged in an argument with the schoolmates before the fight. This degenerated into fisticuffs and Edward Saki was stabbed multiple times. The suspect has only been identified as Godwin from the visual arts class. He has been arrested by the police and in custody. Videos and photos shared on social media showed uh, colleague students in a desperate move Russian Saki to the hospital. Let's get you more on this. Uh, Godwin Asidiba uh, has been following this story. Godwin, good afternoon to you. Tell us uh, what else you know about the situation as it develops. I am in the premises, in the premises, I beg your pardon, of O'Reilly Senior High School. Earlier, some 10 minutes ago, I was at the family house where we had members from the Ghana Education Service, including the Director General, Eric Nkansa, the PRO, Cassandra Chum was also there as well, together with the headmistress of the O'Reilly Senior High School. Now, the meeting lasted for about um, 20 minutes, but it ended inconclusively because the family members did not agree with some of the sentiments that was coming from the camp of the Ghana Education Service. Well, it seems we lost Godwin on that connection, but he was telling us that there's been a meeting between the Ghana Education Service and family of the deceased final year student of O'Reilly Senior High School who was stabbed to death. Um, he tells us that the meeting ended inconclusively because the family could not agree to certain things that, uh, you know, th that were being said or proposals that were being made at the meeting. But we've been reporting on this story from day one when the incident began. The students had an argument. It degenerated into a full-blown fight. Edward Bokitisaki was stabbed in the process. He died of the uh, knife wounds he sustained. And today, the family is meeting with the Ghana Education Service to cover a way forward. We are unsure the whereabouts of the suspect in the case. Uh, another student, uh, supposedly also a final year student, will get you more on this in subsequent broadcasts. Well, returning to the capital, I bring you more stories this afternoon where a pro national democratic congress group, Operation Recover All Loot, is this afternoon picketing at the finance ministry to demand the recovery of all looted state assets. 
My colleague, Noble Crosby Annan, is following this particular story for us. He join us uh, with details shortly. But has been the case and the argument of the NDC promising to prosecute uh, government officials who are found to have engaged in corrupt dealings and acts, and also a sale of state lands. So well, this group is de uh, demanding that action be taken here and now from this current administration. We'll connect with Noble Crosby Annan. Uh, shortly for details. But on your screens is what appears to be uh, minor confrontations between the uh, Pickerton group and then the police because they were seeking to breach uh, the barricaded area, prompting the police to bring in barricades to ensure that they remain cordoned off. Noble Crosby Annan, like I mentioned, is my colleague. He's at the Finance Ministry for us this afternoon. He'll join us right now. Uh, with a bit more details as to what it is that's happening at this particular point in time. Crosby, if you can hear me, uh, has the police been able to calm the Pickerton group? What's the situation now? Well, before we can connect with Crosby, let's take a listen to uh, leadership of the group who've been speaking to journalists. We fight against nepotism, corruption, and stealing. And just by the loop. And to the chairman of the so called economic management team, you have failed this country and failed the youth grossly. Today, the youth of this country cannot take care of themselves. We do not have jobs. They lie to us that they get up 2.1 million jobs. Now the leadership of the oral group. Let's touch base with Noble Crosby Annan right now. Crosby, I was asking if you can provide details as to exactly what's happening at this point in time. Moment, the picketing by the oral group has come to an end. However, uh, the police they were able to eventually control the crowd after. Uh, the first perimeter, the outer perimeter, uh, they set to prevent the protesters from advancing too close to the gate of the finance ministry was breached by the protesters. They were unable to enter the second uh, perimeter, if you like. Uh, the leader of the group, Osman Yarik, addressed uh, the gathering and the media as well, and that's the video you just uh, played. And essentially, they are demanding accountability transparency from the government and they're asking that these two deals that I'm talking about uh, the deal with the uh, SML and the Ghana Revenue Authority as well as the uh, service also Ghana Limited the ambulance servicing deal they all be investigated and they all be scrapped essentially these are the demands that the group have made today they've been able to present uh, the petition to the chief director of the ministry however they intended to present the petition to the Minister of Finance himself or his deputy. That did not happen. Well, that's what Eric alleges that while the protesters were en route here, uh, he got wind that the minister and the deputy, they left the office or the premises to the bank. So hence, they would not be able to present their petition to them. They right. presented it to the leader. Right then, Crosby, uh, many thanks for those details. That's my colleague, Noble Crosby Annan, from the Finance Ministry for us this afternoon will end with the resident of Biampong Akukumbul in the Tempane district of the Upper East Region who've served notice that they will desist from taking part in the 2024 general election should government fail to honor its promise of providing electricity, good roads, potable water, uh, schools and health facilities. Let's just briefly find out from Castro uh, the concerns of the indigents there. Castro, Talk to us, um, how dire of a challenge are all of these things they've been raising are prompting them to issue these threats? Right. Now, uh, according to residents, the lack of electricity, especially in the area, is something that is affecting the approach of economic action. And I know And men, on the other side, too, are not also able to do that. Markets are suffering. And even... So bad, sometimes 700 uh, meters to be able to charge a mobile phone. For them, that is a worry. They also speak of the issue of the lack of schools and health. Right. So, 
Right, uh, Castro, a challenge in being able to hear you. Unfortunately, we'll have to uh, bring an end to that conversation. But the residents, they are demanding government sees through its promise to them or they do not vote. It will bring us to the end of uh, this afternoon's edition of the Bulletin. And we'll see a lot more of these going forward. Persons wanting to exact their pound of flesh yep. and demanding that government makes true on promises to them or they do not vote, or better still, they'll decide to say, we'll vote for the opposition mm -hmm. if it's a stronghold mm -hmm. because you've not seen through a promise for us. Let's just scan quickly and be a part of the 3 News WhatsApp channel. It's a big growing family, like I always say, where you find all things news exclusive from videos to you name it what. All of that and more on 3 News WhatsApp channel and as well on 3news.com. you find links to 3news.com as well. I am Mawina Egbeta. And I am Kemeni Amano. The afternoon show is next. We'll see you same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.